Good evening, uh, dear doctors. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be with you today in this scientific uh, evening. We are going to have an evening with uh, cardiorenal managing disorders, whereby we will be uh, having two eminent speakers who will be with us today to share uh, their knowledge about uh, the cardiorenal managing disorder topic. Uh, we will be starting with Dr. Bahar al Hamsi, who is a consultant and chair of the Internal Medicine Division of, at Sheikh Shakbut Medical City in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Bahar is going to talk to us about practical management of phenerenon. So, welcome, Dr. Bahar. Floor is yours. Let me share the slide. <clears throat> Good evening. Salam alaikum. Uh, I will start with the first lecture. Can you see the screen, please? You see my screen? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes Dr. Okay. Bayer, we can see. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, and thank you for attending this lecture. And thank you, Dr. Jamila, for arranging for this uh, meeting. Uh, my topics today, I'm going to talk about the clinical practice of furinone in chronic kidney disease in type 2 diabetes and the importance of the inflammatory and fibrotic factors in CKD progression in type 2 diabetes. We all know that people who have type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, they have significantly increased the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality comparing to their peers who has only type 2 diabetes and they don't have CKD. Before we start our lecture, I would love to uh, touch some bases about statistics. The International the, uh, Diabetic F F uh, Federation 2019, they have uh, estimated that the number of people with diabetes globally is almost 463 million. That's 9.3% of the global population. 90% of those people who have diabetes has type 2 diabetes. And they looked also at the CKD associated with those uh, type 2 diabetes, they find like two out of five patients who has type 2 diabetes, that's 40%, they have CKD, kind of CKD state, one, two, three, four, or five. And that's in numbers, 160 million patients in 2019, they have type 2 diabetes and CKD. Why we talk about CKD and diabetes always, and we're always concerned about this, because the study on almost like 543,000 patients between 1992 and 2008 showed that patients who has CKD or diabetes, they have shorter uh, life expectancy compared to their peers. For example, for diabetes, the diabetes per se, it shortened the lifespan of any individual by 10 years for men and 11.7 years for women. This is like statistics from the study done between 1994-2008. If the patient has CKD without diabetes, for male, it shortened the life expectancy by 5.7 and for female, 6.7. If he has type 2 diabetes and CKD together, the male, it shortened the life expectancy by almost 15 years and almost 17 years for, for female. So this is very significant always when we treat our patient to look at type 2 diabetes control, and we check our patient for CKD because it has a lot of effect on their, their lifestyle and life expectancy. Sorry, one second. <clears throat> so what the international guidelines tell us about uh, CKD and type 2 diabetes? All the guidelines, almost all the guidelines worldwide, they say if the patient has type 2 diabetes and or CKD, we should check every year the GFR, and urine albumin creatine ratio for our patients. And doctors has to differentiate between two, two uh, identity or two concepts, the kidney function test and the kidney damage test. If you check your patient for GFR, you check in the kidney function test, but you don't check the kidney damage test, you don't, you're not doing the kidney damage test unless you do urine albumin creatine ratio. And remember that you might have a patient with normal GFR, though he has a kidney damage, and how you can tell by doing urine albumin creatine ratio. So it is very important always to check both of them. But how much how are, uh, we are good in doing this in, uh, practically? Well, worldwide, is, uh, it's suboptimal. If you look in the United States, less than 50% of physicians 
they check their patient for urine albumin creatinine ratio. Most of us would check GFR on daily basis when do do electrolyte for our patient, and the lab automatically will record GFR for us. But we don't do the unit album creative ratio, which is very important, at least to do it once a year. In Netherlands, a little bit better, 57% of the patient who need the uh, urine album creative ratio to be checked, they get it checked. In France, very bad, 29% only of the patient, they get urine album creative ratio checked annually. UK may be the best 66, but still suboptimal. We need to reach the optimal number. We need to check it for every patient who has chronic kidney disease or type 2 diabetes to check at least once a year GFR and urine albumin creative ratio. That was like my introduction before I start to talk about uh, the main uh, uh, topics uh, in my lecture today. The inflammation and fibrosis as key drivers of chronic kidney disease progression, especially in type two diabetes. We all know that CKD progression in type two diabetes is driven by multiple factors. Metabolic factors, when I talk about metabolic factors, we talk about hyperglycemia, uncontrolled sugar, hemodynamic factors, which is like elevated blood pressure or even uh, intraglomerular pressure, elevated intraglomerular pressure. And the third factor, which is very important, I'm gonna talk and address today is the inflammatory and fibrotic factors. Why it is very important to talk about the inflammatory factors? Because we all know that inflammation inside the kidneys will cause tubular interstitial damage, mesangial expansion, glomerular hypertrophy, and glomerular sclerosis, which will all lead to the kidney fibrosis and then CKD progression and going from one stage to another stage. So it's very important to address. But patient with type 2 diabetes and advanced chronic kidney disease been studied before, years ago, this study is maybe like more than 12 years ago, done on the kidney function test uh, and adding uh, medication to protect the kidney from getting worse. And by doing uh, those studies, they were addressing the hemodynamic control of the patient who has type 2 diabetes, and they will see the effect of the medication on the kidney function test. Those two important studies, the renal study done by Losartan versus placebo, and IDENT study was done by Irpisartan versus MWB versus placebo. The primary input of those studies, both of them, they were the kidney uh, composite output, doubling uh, serum creatinine, kidney failure, or death. And if we look at the renal study, uh, the, it showed very significant like the decrease uh, in the uh, relative risk reduction in the uh, primary kidney output, 16% was significant p-value. And even the IDENT uh, showed that irpisartan versus amnotopin or versus placebo, it decreased the, uh, the kidney uh, uh, primary input by 20% and was significant p-value. But if we look, look at the, the care, the gray area, the residual risk is still there. It's not down to zero. So people who has chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes, if we, even if we put them on the, what we call a trans system medication, they still get chronic kidney disease and they progress to chronic to end stage renal disease. <clears throat> so to address also the metabolic control, SGLT2 inhibitors came up to the market. And those two studies done by uh, canagliflozine and dabagliflozine, they have patients in this study on the maximum tolerated uh, dose of ACE or ARBs, just to make sure that they are uh, covering the hemodynamic control of the clinic, uh, chronic kidney disease. And they add on top of this, uh, CANA or DAPA. So both studies has two arms. Both arms, remember, they are taking the maximum tolerated dose of ACE or ARBs. And the study showed that uh, in, in uh, Canada, there's like 30% decrease in the relative risk reduction in the kidney output. As I said, again, kidney output, the primary output of both studies was kidney failure, doubling syndrome creatinine, or death from kidney or uh, cardiovascular death. And both arms or both studies, they included patients with high risk. The urine album creatinine ratio in both studies, they were very high. And it showed in the DAPA kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease, there's like 43% reduction in the primary endpoint. But still, again, there is residual risk under the curve and it's not down to zero. So despite getting the maximum dose of ACE or ARBs, 
Despite getting the SGLT2 on board, patient with chronic kidney disease in diabetic type 2 diabetes, they still have progression of their CKD and they will end up years to go with uh, uh, hemodialysis or renal transplant. So the current therapy is primarily targeted to hemodynamic and metabolic factors. We all know that for hemodynamic, we use ACE or ARBs, we use uh, thiazide-like uh, diuretics, we use calcium channel blocker, for the metabolic uh, uh, factor, we use SGLT inhibitor, GLP, RAs, metformin, or other anti uh, hyperglycemic agents. But how about the inflammation and fibrosis? There is no existing treatment primary target inflammation and fibrosis. And remember, the risk factor here when we talk about that residual risk here, maybe part of it is the fibrosis, or actually it is. So we need to address this in our practice and our treatment for our patients. So why would we believe in this? Because people who have type 2 diabetes, their heart or uh, uh, they have kidney and heart diseases, which is associated with what we call it MR overactivation, mineral corticoid uh, receptor overactivation. When we overactivate those MRs, it increases the gene expression for pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic factors on the kidney itself and the heart. And that will lead to inflammation and fibrosis. So the, the, the point behind blocking the MRA, uh, blocking the MR by using MRAs to block uh, the overactivation of that receptors, and we may slow down the CKD progression, which is, as I said, mediated by the inflammation and fibrotic pathways, which is largely now is not addressed by the treatment or the current treatment available. If we do that, we might increase or protect at least the kidneys and the heart for our patients. So how we can block the um, MRs? There is like two types of medication we can use, steroidal or non-steroidal medication. There are several notable like differences between both of them. The phenylalanine, our medication uh, or topics uh, about it today, it's non-steroidal. And uh, the other medication we are comparing to is spironolactone. We have this medication for years in the market. We all have very good experience by using this medication. What is the difference between steroidal and non-steroidal medication? If we look at the effect on the inflammation and fibrosis, and that was based on our preclinical studies, we found out that there's a greater reduction when we use phenylalanine in the effect on inflammation and fibrosis comparing to uh, spironolactone. And if we look at the effect on, uh, on renal electrolyte and disturbances, also the same thing, there is low risk when we use phenylalanine combining to high risk when you use spironolactone. And why this happened? Because of distinct or like unique MR antagonist activity due to the differences in the structure, mode of binding or cofactor recruitment of the medication. If we look at the risk of sexual side effects, also gynecomastia, AD or dysmenorrhea, there is no effect of non-steroidal phenylalanine on uh, our patient for medical placebo. On the other hand, when we use spironolactone, we all know that there is increased risk for versus placebo. And this is because of the phenylalanine is like highly selective to MRs. And on the other side, spironolactone is it has low uh, selectivity to MR. Risk of hyperkalemia is there in both of them. But low risk in, this, uh, in the phenylalanine, and it's usually manageable. If you put your patient on phenylalanine and you find like the patient has hyperkalemia, you just stop the medication and that's all. And the, the potassium will go down to normal level. But if we use phenylalanine, maybe you need to do more than stopping the medication. Maybe you need to act more. And about uh, the effect on systolic blood pressure, there's moderate effect of phenylalanine on the systolic blood pressure comparing to high. Uh, effect of spironolactone uh, on uh, systolic blood pressure. So non-steroidal medication, it's much better than using steroidal medication uh, to block the MR. So what the, are the uh, phase three uh, trials on phenylalanine we have? There's two important uh, phase three uh, trials with complementary kidney and cardiovascular endpoint. The two studies we called Fidelio study and Figaro study. The Fidelio study, the primary endpoint was the kidney. So time to onset of kidney failure, sustained decrease of GFR equal or more than 40% uh, from the baseline, or death due to the kidney uh, disease. And the secondary endpoint 
who was the primary endpoint for Figaro. So secondary endpoint for Fidelio is a composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. So they have recipro reciprocal uh, endpoints. And both of them, they have other endpoints also during the study they monitor, all cause mortality, all cause hospitalization, any change in your album creative ratio and other uh, endpoints. So in my topics, I'm going to uh, concentrate on Fidelio and Dr. Wakar in his topic, we'll talk about Figaro study. So in those two studies, a uh, patient included in this study, any patient with type 2 diabetes and CKD, who uh, was uh, started or treated with ACE or ARBs at maximum tolerated dose was normal uh, uh, potassium level, less or equal to 4.8 millimole. The people involved in those studies, they have different kinds of uh, chronic kidney disease and different stages. Majority of them, they have from grade one to grade four. And when we look at the urine albumin ratio uh, for those people who were involved in those study, it's between A2 and A3. A2, that mean albumin, uh, urine albumin credit ratio between 30 to 300, and more than 300, we call it A3. So the majority of those people who were involved in this study, they have major uh, kidney uh, damage tests. So Fidelio DK, diabetic, uh, diabetic kidney disease study, again, the, the study design is like a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. They involved almost 14,000 patients, and the run-in was between four to 16 weeks, Everybody got optimized uh, ACE or ARP therapy, the, the, the maximum tolerated test done for all these patients. And then they screened them who met the criteria of the study, they get involved in the study. And they uh, choose almost 5,734 patients, and they were randomized to two groups. Remember again that two groups receive the maximum tolerated taste, uh, the maximum tolerated dose of ACE or ARPs. One arm received placebo and the second arm received the medication in study phenylalanine. And the dose of the medication was depending on the GFR. If the GFR less than 60 received 10 milligram, if GFR more than 60 received 20 milligram. The primary endpoint was the kidney composite. Time to the kidney failure sustained more or equal to 40% decrease in GFR from the baseline or renal death. The key uh, secondary endpoint was cardiovascular composite, which is non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, hospitalization for heart failure, or time to cardiovascular death. And this is a criteria for the uh, inclusion criteria. Any patient above 18 year old with type two diabetes, JFR ranging between 25 to 75, maximum tolerated dose of ACE or ARPS at least four weeks before the study time, moderate or severely increased albuminuria, and potassium should be less than or equal to 4.8. We exclude from the study anybody who has HFRF, uh, New York uh, Heart Association class two or four, uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, very high A1C, or any patient who has any other kidney disease. So the major patients who were involved in this study, as we said, between uh, grade three A and grade three B in the state and albuminuria moderately to severe. 90%, almost 90% of the people who were involved in this study, they have severe increased urine albumin creatine ratio. Only 10% they have moderate. And the majority, as I said, between stage three and four uh, uh, kidney disease. So what the, the, in summary, the characteristic of the study, at baseline, patients who were involved in this study had advanced CKD, the mean GFR was almost 54, and the median urine albumin kidney ratio was almost 850. And the, the patients involved in the study, they were 98% on maximum tolerated dose of ACE, 99% on maximum uh, tolerated dose of ARBs. And uh, adherence to the treatment was high in both groups, in the placebo group and the feronal group. Almost 92% of the patient, they were adhering to the uh, treatment. And the cumulative treatment duration and the number of permanent discontinuation is very similar between the two groups. 
And the time for or the median follow up uh, time was 2.6 years for both arms. And as I said, the primary end, end point was the kidney specific thrombosis. Time to kidney failure, any sustained more than or equal to 40% decrease in GFR from the baseline or renal death. And here is the result. The difference between the two groups, there is like 18% relative risk reduction in the primary endpoint in the group who received phenylalanine comparing to the placebo. So, and remember that's on the top of maximum tolerated uh, tre uh, treatment from ACE or ARBs. So phenylalanine significantly reduced the primary kidney outcome by almost 18% during the study. And if we look at the urine albumin keratin ratio, there is a significant decrease within four months, 31% decrease in the urine albumin keratin ratio in the group who received phenylalanine comparing to placebo. And that uh, benefit was sustained during the study. It's still good for the almost like 36 months. How about the secondary cardiovascular output uh, or outcome, which is non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, hospitalization for heart failure, or time to cardiovascular days. Also, the study showed there is like 14% relative risk reduction in the, in the secondary cardiovascular output in the, the, the arm who received phenylalanine comparing to the arm who received placebo. And that was also sustained during the study. And this is, again, just to remember that on the top of maximum tolerability uh, dose of RAS therapy. Why are we saying this? Because we need to know that this effect is not secondary to the RAS treatment. This is the effect of the medication we use for uh, in our study, which is furanol. How about the safety and vital signs for our patients? The incidence of treatment emergent adverse events was very much similar between the two groups, the treatment group and the placebo group. If we look at any adverse events, there is no difference at all between the two groups. Any serious adverse events, there is no differences again. Acute kidney injury, there is no differences between the two groups. Any like uh, gynecomastia, also there is no differences between the two groups. So it was very safe medication to use. How about the effects on the blood pressure or the sugar? There is little bit changes in the systolic blood pressure, almost three millimeter of mercury decrease in the systolic blood pressure in the arm who received phenylalanine comparing to placebo. And for the A1C, there's no changes between the two arms. It was very much similar. How about the effect on the potassium? We all know that this is our concern always when we uh, add uh, medication affecting the MR receptor or uh, mineral corticoid receptors. Serum potassium, there is the minimum expected or what they call it like uh, uh, predictable impact on the serum potassium. The changes was 0 0.23 millimole at four months uh, uh, treatment and was the same for the whole study. So only minimal changes in the potassium level, 0 0.23 millimole comparing to the placebo. And if we look at the incidence of like uh, the, or what we call it the investigator reported adverse effects regarding the hyperkalemia, what the, uh, the, the treatment and what the uh, effect on the treatment uh, of our patient. If we look at the, uh, all adverse events, there's no much differences, 9% in placebo, 18% in uh, the filaron arm. If we look at which was related, the uh, adverse effects, which was related specifically to the study drugs, only 11.8% comparing to 4.8. How about hospitalization because of the hyperglycemia, leading to permanent discontinuation of the medication? Very low number, 2.3%. Leading to hospitalization because of the hyperkalemia, uh, almost 1.4%. Leading to death, zero. None of the, uh, the, the, the patient has any uh, 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 serious consequ uh, consequences of the treatment. So how they deal with hyperkalemia in the study, during the study? First of all, when they started the study, as we said at the beginning, they screened everybody for GFR. If the patient involved in the study, GFR between 25 to 60%, they give him small dose, 10 milligram daily. If the patient has GFR more than 60, they give him 20 milligram daily. And then after that, after one month, 
they check the potassium level. And if you allow me, you go down here after first sample, if the potassium level is still less or equal to 4.8, you continue the same treatment if you're giving your patient 20 milligram. And if he was giving your patient 10 milligram, you might need to titrate up to 20 milligram. And if your patient a, uh, potassium level was more than 5.5 after one month, then you withhold the study drugs and recheck potassium in 72 hours. After 72 hours, if the potassium more than five, you still continue to hold your medication. If your potassium less than five, then restart with 10 milligrams. So it's very easy to do. And then they recommend also to check it again after four months and you do the same thing. Just make sure that your patient potassium is less than 5.5 or less than five. How about the international guidelines? After doing those studies with Phenoron and published uh, globally, the international guidelines, they start to uh, talk about MRAs. And... Yes? The uh, American Diabetic Association and KDGO consensus statement, they said, an, a non-steroidal MRA with proving kidney and cardiovascular benefit, it's recommended for patients with type 2 diabetes with GFR more than 25, normal serum potassium, and urine albumin creatinine ratio more than 30. That's exactly the patient were in the studies, in the FIDALO study. And patient was on maximum tolerated dose of FRAS. And this is the Kirijo 2022 guidelines. They put uh, non-steroidal uh, MRA as a class 2A recommendation. If you look here on the left side, non-steroidal MRA with proven kidney and cardiovascular benefit is suggested in patients with type 2 diabetes, GFR more than 20, mag uh, normal serum potassium, and albuminuria more than 30, despite maximum tolerated uh, dose of FRASI. This is very important and is very much recommended by the American Diabetic Association and the Kidigo uh, uh, Association. And this is how to approach the heart, kidney and heart risk factor management. You start with lifestyle management first, and then you add the medication, metformin, SGLT2, RAS comes uh, here, and the statin here. And then the third things, like you need to address the inflammation, you use non steroid MRA medication for treatment for your patients. So to conclude, if you start to use your medication for your patient, practically in practice, how to monitor potassium? This is your main concern. As we said, make sure that you select your patient very well and you select the right dose for your patient from the beginning. If the GFR less than 60, use 10 milligram once a day. If the GFR more than 60, you can use 20 milligram from the first day. And make sure that your patient potassium from the beginning less than four or equal to 4.8. After one month, you check your patient potassium. Less than 5.5, you just continue the treatment. More than 5.5, you discontinue the treatment. You check in 72 hours, and then you start smaller dose. Thank you very much. I hope I did not take too much time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bahar, for this uh, rich and enlightening presentation. And um, we would move now to our next presenter, Dr. Waqar Gaba. Dr. Waqar is a senior consultant physician of internal medicine and a stroke lead in Sheikh Khalifa Medical City. Dr. Waqar is going to talk to us about phenylalanine as a novel solution to manage chronic kidney disease in type 2 diabetes. Welcome, Dr. Waqar. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Jamila for a nice introduction and uh, it's uh, thanks uh, Bayer for giving me this opportunity and Emirates Society of Internal Medicine to talk on a really important topic uh, on phenylalanine as a novel solution to manage CKD in type 2 diabetes. Uh, I won't take much time for my introduction but uh, if there are any interruptions or um, any problems then please let me know otherwise I'll continue for probably 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll have questions and answers at the end of the session. So without further ado, uh, my objectives of my session are in front of you. Uh, you can see all my slides. Uh, someone can tell me. So 
slides. Yeah, we can see the yeah. slides. Okay, yes. great. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Bahar and Thompson. Okay, so objectives of my talk today will be will briefly talk about like what Dr. Bahar did. Uh, relation between CKD and type 2 diabetes, a uh, little bit touch on non-steroidal MRAs like phenarinone. Uh, like Dr. Bahar said that uh, I'm going to talk more about Figaro, although he talked about more Fidelio study, uh, then about a fidelity meta-analysis, what the international guidelines say. Again, although Dr. Bahar touched on this, we'll talk about some real cases and then what's the future. So as you could see, that diabetes and CKD both go hand in hand. This is the mortality figures for cardiovascular mortality. As you can see, if you're having diabetes alone, CKD or both, your times of mortality goes higher and higher as expected. More interestingly, when we look at the urinary bilirubin creatinine ratio, Dr. Bahir again touched on that how much we are actually checking urinary bilirubin creatinine ratio. And then we are amazed to see that as the urinary bilirubin creatinine ratio goes up and up, the mortality goes higher and higher. On the other hand, as you can see, if the EGFR goes lower and lower, again, the mortality goes higher and higher. So why do we need another MRA? Well, we did have spironolactone, but we did have alprinone as well but we needed another non-steroidal MRA. Because one of the things is that this is the paper in 2015, what they looked at is that spinal lactone should be weighed against its potential risk like hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia and the renal functions were the main problem by counting using spinal lactone. So in 2013, we're talking about 10 years ago, this drug, which we're talking about now, was used in randomized double blind control trial. And as you can see that it was recommended that five to 10 milligram per day was at least as effective as spinal lactone of this dose in decreasing biomarkers for lower incidence of hyperkalemia and worsening renal function. So like my colleague already discussed about Fidelio, so I'm gonna more talk about Figaro. Now what's Figaro? Just a bit touch on Fidelio, what Dr. Bahar said that, Fidelio, on one hand, was more talked about moderate to severe disease, as you could see, uh, where he, uh, where you have like G3 and 4 up to these. But there's an, a bit of overlap. But then Figaro, DKD, talked about more mild disease, as, as you can see, that EGFR is more than 60. But also with the, those patients who have urinary albumin creatinine ratio 30, less than 30, uh, 300. In another slide, you can see that both studies had the disinclusion criteria. Uh, criteria. Can you, you can see for Figaro DKD that uh, UACR 30 to 300, EGFR 25 to 90, or UACR 30 to 300 to more, but with EGFR more than 60. So we're talking about these kind of patients, if you can see my cursor, these kind of patients where the EGFR is actually normal or more than 60, but they still have urinary bilirubin creatinine ratio is higher. So the exclusion criteria were very similar as to earlier studies where the patients who have non-diabetic kidney disease, uncontrolled hypertension, very severe HPA1C, dialysis patients, transplant patients, they were all excluded. So again, similar to Fidelio, uh, you have a, a 7,000 patients this time. Pinerinone was tested against placebo, 10 or 20 milligram against the placebo dose. And they were followed up. And this time, not the renal time. So it's the reverse order. So this time, we looked at the primary endpoints where the cardiovascular composite and the secondary outcome was the kidney composite. Now, when we talk about the cardiovascular composite, it was more time to cardiovascular death, non-fetal MI, non-fetal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. So let's take one by one. So first, let's take the cardiovascular composite. Before taking the cardiovascular composite, you have to see that whether the baseline characteristics were matched or not. So you can see in this study that whether it's a blood pressure, HbA1c, whether the uh, additional medications like metformin or SLG2, uh, EGFR, UACR, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, all of them were matched. They were very similar to placebo. So baseline characteristics in both groups were very similar. This is an overview, if you could see, that looking at the primary composite outcome, kidney composite outcome as the secondary overall, and I'll take it further. 
overall, they were all very much favoring towards the phenarinone. So let's take the first uh, primary composite outcome. There is 13% reduction, as you can see, uh, primary cardiovascular outcome by 13% in comparison to placebo. Now, what's it driven by mostly by hospitalization for heart failure? So you could see that overall, there is 13% relative risk reduction in the primary composite outcome, but it was mainly driven by hospitalization for heart failure, although all favoring towards not. So again, the same thing. We looked at the baseline, the baseline urine albumin creatinine ratio, whichever it is, whether it's the EGFR, whether it's the blood pressure, or whether it's the HbA1c. Overall, as you can see, that all these uh, diamonds, you can see that they're all favoring towards pinerinone. So the bottom line is the primary cardiovascular outcome, although mainly driven by hospitalization for heart failure, was favoring towards pinerinone at significant reduction of 13%. Now let's look at the secondary outcome, which is the composite kidney outcomes. Uh, I would like you to focus on the left side first. Uh, the secondary kidney composite outcome, talking about whether there is, if there is a more than 40% decrease in the EGFR from the baseline time to kidney failure, in other words. So how long it took or more than 40% decrease in EGFR from the baseline. Fortunately, it did not receive, it did not achieve the statistical significance, but you can see that again, there's 13% relative restriction with p-value of 0 0.07. But then they did the exploratory additional kidney outcome with 57% decrease and it did actually improve even further. So both primary composite and the secondary outcome uh, composite were in the favor. This is from Reylop, who has done lots of uh, work on phenerinone on these studies. And as you can see, it was published in Nephrology Dial uh, Dialysis Transplant Volume in the Oxford Press. Um, looked at the 7,000 patients, again, the Figaro DKD, what we're talking about. And what you could see from this, graph is that if you have a more urinary albumin creatinine ratio, more than 300, whether it's more than 40% or more than 57% kidney composite outcome, you have definite evidence that going towards phenerinone. So if really the patient's having, the, it's so much emphasis on urinary albumin creatinine ratio, if they're really having a bad this, okay, you really need to have, you have more benefit. Now, in, in regards to cardiovascular composite, actually, regardless of this urine women creatinine ratio, you're going to get benefit, which we showed 13% relative risk reduction. So is this bad? Like, of course, you wonder whether this is a new drug. It might come up with new side effects. It might come up with new problems. Now, contrary to what we would think, that the whole idea is about hyperkalemia. Does it cause hyperkalemia? Of course it does cause hyperkalemia, but not big numbers. From Figaro DKD, you only have 1.2%. So in comparison to placebo, rather than 13 patients, there are 46 patients. But remember, these 46 patients are uh, out of nearly 4,000 patients. So the numbers are not much in terms of permanent discontinuation. So numbers are not much to think that you have to stop this drug. In terms of renal-related adverse events, similarly, discontinuation of trial regime, you only had to stop 0.7% of them, only 26 cases where you had to stop this drug because of API. So in summary, about Fidelio and Figaro DKD results, like what uh, Dr. Bahar showed as well, I'm talking more about Figaro here. So Fidelio looked at more advanced disease, three stage three to four disease. Garo is talking about more mild disease, stage one to two disease. Fidelio looked at more CKD about renal progression as a primary component. Figaro looked at more CD mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and proved that, that there is 13% reduction. And looked at the secondary composite outcome as well as CKD progression. So that takes me to fidelity. Fidelity is actually a meta-analysis of combining both. So let's combine both. When we combine both, this is again in Oxford University Press, you can see European Heart Journal endorsed by ESC, looking at the fidelity overall analysis of 13,000 patients, which were used both in Figaro and 
fidelity. In the fidelity, it was compared as a metal analysis. They looked at the all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, sudden cardiac death. The bottom line is that if you have a patient with CKD and type 2 diabetes, Neuronon demonstrated significant on-treatment reduction in the incidence of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and lowered the risk of sudden cardiac death in intention to treat. Those of you who love the graphs, who love some colors, this is just to show you Fidelio DKD, like what we just talked about, 18% risk reduction. Vigario talking about 13% risk reduction in the cardio endpoint. And in summary, from this Fidelio study, when we combine both, you can have a composite endpoint from renal 23% and cardio 15% relative risk reduction. So this is just to compare a little one more slide for fidelity in treatment resistant hypertension and the patients with, with the AMBER studies as well. So what is it about? What is it showing you? So what it's showing you is that nerinone was associated with similar, smaller reduction in systolic blood pressure and a lower risk of hyperkalemia, which we already just showed, in comparison to spironolactone with or without a potassium binding agent. Here, the potassium binding agent was used as Pecrimer. So essentially, it's showing you that if the uh, if this uh, venerinone was used, it has not much effect actually on blood pressure, contrary to spinal lactone. On the other hand, in terms of hyperkalemia, you can see lesser incidence of hyperkalemia in venerinone patients. So, so far we're talking about Figaro, Fidelity, then mental analysis, has it this translated all into international guidelines? Yes, it has. Uh, Dr. Barr showed some of it that it has translated into American Diabetes Association. I'm just showing you some about ESC guidelines. So these are recent ESC guidelines and very much so you can see right where the SLG2 inhibitors are. As we now know that this is becoming the norm that these are class one drugs. Similarly, if you're on here, you have a patient with diabetes, you have a patient with CKD, they both need to reduce the cardiovascular and renal risk, and they need phenerinone. So as you can see again here, you do the BP control, you do the SLG inhibitors, and you need to put phenerinone. So if you are going to reduce the cardiovascular risk, we know the 1A recommendation of statins, we know the ACE or ARBs are must, and now, new thing is about phenerinone. Who can you give phenerinone is for those who already have been on ACE or ARBs on maximum doses. These are the patients with type 2 diabetes and they have an EGFR or more than 60 with this USER uh, ranges or USER is more than three to reduce the cardiovascular events and kidney failure as I showed you. Oh, is it just ESC? No, Kidigo as well. So Kidigo is saying on the similar island again. So uh, non-steroidal, which is phenerinone with proven kidney or cardiovascular benefits for patients with type 2 diabetes and EGFR more than 25 with albuminuria, who already on maximum tolerated dose of RAC inhibitors. So American Diabetes Association at, and Kidigo had a similar line consensus statement, which again, you sh uh, was seen, uh, you saw it earlier, uh, showing the same consensus statement that non-steroidal MRA. So it's the ESC, it's the American Diabetes Association, it's the Kidigo, all of them now coming up as good recommendation for phenerinone. I'll now take you to two practical cases which I've come across of different spectrum. So about first case. This is a 50 years old female who came to us with worsening proteinuria, uh, known diabetic for seven years, known hypertension, family history of type 2 diabetes and coronary artery disease, non-smoker, good lifestyle actually, and these are the medications you would expect on somebody like this on this, and this is what she was on. So she's on macformin and semaglutide, already on maximum dose of ARB, uh, calcium channel blocker, statins, aspirin. These are the examination and investigation findings. You can see that uh, there is blood pressure is normal, well-controlled HbA1c, ural albumin creatinine ratio on a higher side on 320, but normal EDFR, okay? We have a potassium of 4.3. Patient, very well what we are talking about, phenerinone. 
So somebody who's already on ARB, maximum tolerated dose, somebody who is type 2 diabetes, and somebody who's got urine and creatinine ratio of greater than 300, but normal EGFR. This patient was stuck, actually, you know, SLT2 inhibitors, but did not tolerate well, so it was, they were stopped. So my question to you, you just to think about, is that, is this patient really at cardiovascular risk with normal EGFR, okay? Well, you might think maybe it's a low risk or at the maximum moderate risk, but actually ESC tells you that this is, I've just got from ESC, and as you can see, that Protein urea, if its ACR is more than 300, puts you at very high cardiovascular risk. So you need to minimize this risk. But how do you minimize this risk? So you have an option of adding ACE. We know that it doesn't do much when you add ACE inhibitors on top of ARBs. You have an option of amlodipine changing to diltes, and does it really add anything? You have an option, of course, of adding spironolactone, but this patient is already having uh, like EGFR at the moment is fine, but it can cause more hyperkalemia or it can cause worsening of renal function. But do you have other options? Yes, you have. Like as I told you, you have an option of finerenone. So this patient, as you can see, that UACR has gone from slowly from 65 to 320. So this patient has got G1A3 disease in terms of albuminuria and EGFR. So we started the patient on phenylalanine on 20 milligram daily, and you could see, look at that, the reduction, 35% reduction from 320 to 208 of urine membrane creatinine in a few weeks. Let's take the next patient. So this patient is 66 years old with worsening protein urea, completely asymptomatic, again, diabetic and hypertensive, CKD, uh, you have sedentary lifestyle in this patient, was obese. Uh, if I remember, we'll see in the next slide. Already on ACE maximum dose, already on SLG2 inhibitors, uh, already on statin and aspirin. So you think that everything is done. Well, what can we add? It's already on the maximum dose. Let's look at the investigations. Uh, BMI is okay, actually, 27.7, so not a lot. Uh, normal blood pressure, HbA1c of 6.5%. Okay, so urobrimin is not above 300, but it's 250. And EGFR is on a lower side, now 58. So this is what you are getting worried about now, okay? The patient is, if you don't do, you think you have done enough. If you take the previous slide, you have done already. Why You can't really add anything. The sugar is controlled. What else you need to do? Let's look at it. So this patient comes up in 3AA2, again, as we said, so the first patient was the one with my study, you know, which I explained you, Figaro DKD study. It's not my study, but the one which I explained you. And the previous one, which was Dr. Bahir explained you, this patient comes into this, where you should think about stopping or reducing the CKD progression. So we started phenerin on 10 milligram, as you notice that it's 10 milligram this time because EGFR is less than 60. And look at this, the, again, the UACR has gone down from 255 to 185. So I'm reaching to my final slides. Um, so what's the future? Future is bright. I Let me tell you, in next few years, you will see a lot of studies, really a lot of studies for phenerinone in those who have not yet covered in the studies which we just mentioned to you. For instance, I found this. There is a confidence study coming up again by Bayer where they're comparing the combi combination of venerinone and empaglophizone. Bear in mind that there will be, uh, I have a prediction that very soon the SLT2 and venerinone combination will become the norm. There is another study called Fine Arts Art Failure Study. It, this one is looking at, which were excluded in these studies, which we just talked about, is the patients who are half PEF. So the ones who have greater or equal to 40% LVAF. This is, I found, FIND1 trial is coming up as well. So FIND1 trial is actually on type 1 diabetes. Remember, we talked about here type 2 diabetes. What about type 1 diabetes? They might have CKD as well. There is fine CKD. What is fine CKD? There is coming a non-diabetic kidney disease. So you might not have diabetes, but you have kidney disease. Does phenylalanine work for those? And there's another one which makes sense again. What about those patients, big chunk of patients who have got heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? 
does that work for them as well? So that's the future what will tell us that when do they come and what the results would be. And that takes me to just an answers. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me again. And I'm happy for taking any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Waqaf, for the uh, presentation. Uh, both our speakers have covered almost all aspects of uh, the medication and the indications. And uh, we have one question here, if uh, take here from, uh, which says, what are the advantages of phenerenone over erperinone, sorry for the pronunciation, in diabetic kidney uh, patients? If somebody could answer that question. Uh, I'm not aware about any study done on erperinone uh, and uh, CKD in type 2 diabetes. I'm not sure if we can answer this question without any evidence-based medicine. But uh, the studies we have now on Firon and on, and we have the good results on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the audience have got any questions because actually everything is covered and it left no room for the uh, audience also to ask questions, but I'm sure that it might... Uh, Stimulate some questions if anybody has got any question from their side. Um, this is overwhelming. It looks like that either we were too good or either we they didn't understand anything. Okay, that's normally the case. But okay. I, I would say that if the ones who don't want to speak up, they might just write questions. We are here. So I think probably mm -hmm. I actually, both of us, both me and Dr. Bahar, and it before our own time. Yeah. I just like need to uh, uh, instruct the audience or the physician like to look in the future for the upcoming studies. Phenoron is going to be like very good medication for your patient. And just follow up the studies Dr. Okar talked about. The medication is going to be studied with SGLT2 IMPA. It's going to be studied on HEFREF or HEFPEF also. So this is good medication. Now they are talking about it. And there's like good results on the CKD and the heart uh, cardiovascular uh, results. Okay. Um, we've got one question here. But before that, we had some comments from colleagues here who said that uh, the presentation was too good. That's why probably they're not answer. asking many questions. Okay, uh, there is a question here which says, can we initiate it soon after acute on top of chronic CKD? Well, uh, usually what we do, like if your uh, patient uh, back to his baseline GFR, and you're very much sure that this is baseline, because you remember, you need to choose the dose of the medication depending on the baseline GFR. And if your patient potassium is 4.8 or less, yes, you can initiate directly. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what Dr. Bahar said, uh, essentially, uh, it, it's about the EGFR as well. And go with the recommendations from as per the study. So study was very well designed and study, both studies were actually very, uh, they have strict criteria of inclusion and exclusion criteria. If your patient is fitting into those inclusion criteria, you are good to go. You're good to start the patient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a question for Dr. Bahar here who said, um, could you please mention whether potassium levels should be more, uh, I mean, he said that you mentioned the hyperkalemia. So could you please mention whether the potassium level should be more than five according to the ESC guidelines uh, 2023 or should, should we wait until it is 5.5 to stop it? Yeah, usually to be on the safe side, usually, as we said, we check like in one month and if it's less than or uh, more than 5.5, definitely you want to stop. If it's like 5.5 or less, close monitoring is good. If it's less than 5, you feel uh, safe, very safe. So the, the, the problem between the 5 and 5.5, this is like critical for our patient. Depending on your lab results or reported, 
if your lab consider the normal is up to five, which is what usually uh, consider, I will stop. If it's more than five, I will stop, repeat in 72 hours. And then when it is less than five, I will restart with 10 milligrams. Okay. Um, there is also another question. Do we need to discontinue the other medications like SGLT2? Uh, if we decide to start the phenylalanine, no, actually, no, 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 we don't yeah. stop the medication. We need to be, keep our patient on the maximum RASI medication, SGLT2 inhibitors, and we add phenylalanine, and we just observe and uh, monitor the potassium level. Or rather, on the contrary, like as I said in my presentation, the future might be that SLG2 inhibitors and phenylalanine might be combined together to see their mm -hmm. more benefits. It, like as yeah. I said, in the study, confidence study, it will be coming up soon. And other, I think other SLG2 inhibitors will, I'm very sure, will start combining phenylalanine with, with their product as well and trying to show that the, the results get actually even better with both drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question is, how much decrease in GFR uh, we can expect after the initiation? And is this decrease irreversible? Uh, they are talking about maybe like 30% decrease in GFR after initiation, but usually it's like just like one dip and it goes back to the baseline. You just monitor. So that's why we, we do like the one month uh, the blood test. After one month of starting the medication, we look at the GFR and we look at the uh, the potassium level. But we are not like, usually you expect phenylalanine to help your patient not to decrease the GFR. Okay. Um, There's more question down here. Yeah. Um, here do they are asking about uh, if we could add um, here any role of GLP uh, one. RA in CKD, I believe this is uh, SGL2 has proven its efficacy very well, but can we add on top of the SGL T2 inhibitors? Well, like depending, we on, depending on the patient, blood sugar and A1C, if you need it, yes, you can. There is no harm to add SGL uh, P uh, RA on top of SGL T2 uh, inhibitor, but usually one of them is enough. What do you think, Dr. Wakar? Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, essentially what we're talking about, this is not for diabetes medications. So I, I didn't understand the question. Are they trying to say that they want to have all three together? So both GL1, uh, GLP, SLT2, and phenylalanine. Okay, probably the one who typed the question. Can you type again an explanation if you don't mind, please? Okay. Until that time, let us move. Do you recommend stopping it temporarily in patients admitted with acute kidney injury? Depending on the potassium level only. If the potassium level is high, yes, I will stop it. But if the potassium level is not high, remember medication is for inflammation and fibrotic changes. So it's better to keep the kidney always out of inflammation. So you don't stop the medication unless you have to for side effects like hyperkalemia. Yes, I would stop it. Yeah, agree, completely agree. Especially if the potassium is going more than five. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's a question if the drug has got any effect on patients with HEPF. That study, Dr. Uh, Wakar was telling yes. that it's ongoing studies. It's a fine art study. It's it's going to be ongoing study. When we will get the answer soon. Okay. Um. But remember that the, the Figaro study, sorry, Dr. Wakar, showed a benefit of heart failure hospitalization by using uh, phenylalanine. So we we can tell it helps the CHF level, but we need more uh, specific or designated study for that one. Yeah, I agree because the heart because it, it clearly shows the heart failure for hospitalization got better. So that tells you that the further studies when will be done for for both half PEF and half ref, it will further yeah. improve. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
I think, okay, there is a question here. Uh, the diabetic kidney disease has a potential for pillars similar to heart failure, which are the maximum dosage of ACE, ARB, SGLT2 inhibitors, and phenylalanine, uh, and possible GLP-1 uh, injectable. Any I future ideas? That's just a question like... Yeah, I think this is a comment like what they're trying to say yeah. that they're absolutely yes. right. So already on ACE, ARBs, SLG2 inhibitors, phenarinone now, and GLP-1s are hard, uh, like really the pillars. One thing which I will, I mean, I'll let Dr. Bahir answer that, but one thing which probably going to add very soon is the potassium binders as well. So the o, the uh, like petromer and sodium zirconium, that will be very soon become the norm as well, especially the ones who have resistant hyperkalemia and the ones with the hyperkalemia is a problem. Yeah, exactly. That European Society of Cardiology now, they recommended that you use the maximum dose of ACE or ARBs. And if you have a problem with hyperkalemia to add a potassium binder like a petromer or sodium zirconium on the top to allow your patient to be on the maximum dose of RASI. This is very important. And now SGLT2 inhibitor there in the guidelines. And as we said now, ADA and KDGO, they added phenylalanine to it. So the problem mm -hmm. what you have to all understand is that uh, if the audience is listening to us, that uh, we uh, the patient who gets the worsening of their uh, renal function, uh, if they are if they cannot tolerate because of that, if you stop A ACE or ARBs because you can't get to the maximum tolerated dose, especially because of hyperkalemia, you actually bring by stopping them, you're making things even worse for them because this is for their benefit for both cardiovascular and renal. So you should do now cardiology, European Society of Cardiology put very much emphasis like what Dr. Barra said that go into the maximum dose and to get into the maximum dose, if you have to do measures like adding phenarinone or potassium binders, that will help. Right. Okay, there's somebody here who is saying, uh, why uh, do we care about the hyperkalemia in the presence of uh, potassium binders, whether the sodium uh, zirconium or uh, petromer um, well, that, that probably this is related to the side effect of the phenylalanine itself. Right. Yeah, some people, they, as I said in the literature, uh, the recommended by the company and the studies that to stop the phenylalanine whenever you have hyperkalemia. But some people I saw, they just add, especially the nephrologists, they just add petromer or they add sodium zirconium to treat the hyperkalemia and they would love to keep the phenylalanine on board. You can do that, but you need to monitor the patient closely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we are coming to a conclusion of uh, our topic for uh, this evening. And uh, I would like to thank both our speakers for their uh, very informative lectures. Thank you, Dr. Bahar. Thank you, Dr. Waqar. And thank you, uh, thank you everybody for attending with us and uh, have uh, a great rest of the weekend and good evening to everybody. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.